Okay, so now we're starting Express. So Express is another backend. We've only looked at one so far. That was Rails one and a half. If you did that little Sinatra mini lesson, yeah, I just started it recording. If you see this little circle with a square inside it, that means it's recording. Um, let me make sure the mic is on. That should be good. Uh, yeah, so it's another backend, um, just like. Rails is a backend, just like Sinatra is a backend, just like PHP is a backend. It's yet another backend. Uh, so Express and Node, you're going to see those go like hand in hand in the same sentence all the time. Node is just sort of like it's a way of doing using JavaScript to process files, basically. So JavaScript, when you run it in your browser, it can't do anything with the files on your computer. JavaScript's entire world is just your web browser. Node is JavaScript stuff that can do things on your computer. It doesn't have anything to do with your browser anymore. So it's like the opposite, except it's still written in JavaScript. So that's Node. Express is taking Node and sort of focusing it, extending it, so that it takes that file reading, file writing functionality and turns it into a full web server, something that can receive requests from other computers and send requests or send responses back to that computer, send requests to other computers. So we're not going to be doing anything in just plain old Node. In fact, I don't really know anyone who's done anything in just plain old Node, except for maybe Jesse, who really likes Node. Um, we're going to be doing stuff inside Express. It's kind of like how you may have noticed that Rails, when you boot it up, it says something about Webbrick or Webrick. I'm still not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, that's sort of like the underlying stuff underneath Rails that Rails is built on. Um, so Webbrick is to Rails like Node is to Express. Uh, so yeah, here's this question. Why does Express exist? Why not just use Rails or Sinatra or whatever? What do you think? Some people like JavaScript. Exactly, because some people like JavaScript. Uh, and I mean, it's like, you know, you're using JavaScript in your front end all the time, so Maybe it's sort of nice to be doing it in the back end as well. Only one language to worry about. And I know when I switch back and forth between Ruby and JavaScript, I keep on get forgetting about semicolons and parentheses and all that stuff. So that consistency is kind of nice. Yeah, I would say that's the biggest reason. That's literally like the biggest reason. It's just some people like JavaScript better. There aren't like secret functionalities or anything. And I mean, this is true, like, whenever, if someone uses Django or Rails or some other backend, they're doing it just because they happen to like it better or because that's just the one they happen to know. Usually there's not, like, a good reason for it beyond that. Um, Express is very, very small and very, very lightweight. So when you do Rails new, you get, like, 8,000 files. When you do Express new, well, it doesn't exist. You don't get anything. Express, you start off with literally nothing, and then you make it file by file. There are express generators out there, but we're not using that. We're doing it the badass, hard-ass way. We're doing it from scratch. Uh, so this class is going to be something we haven't really done before, where we're going to walk through the process of making an entire mean app. Well, a men app. We're not getting into the A, which is Angular. Uh, but we're going to be working with Mongo, Express, and Node. So the goal of this class is not for you to suddenly know everything about Express. This is sort of like a survey class where I, we're together just going to like build all this stuff so you can see what the different parts are at the beginning. And then for the rest of this unit, you're going to be working back into that and getting more focused onto what those different parts are. So in this class, you're going to get exposure to Mongo and Express. Um, and then later on, you're going to be diving deeper into exactly how those work. So I'm framing this this way because you're totally going to have questions, and that's fine. Ask your questions. But if it gets really deep, I may push back on it and be like, hey, hold up until you get to your Mongoose class or your Mongo class. Um, wait until you get to that point. And we actually have built into the schedule a whole big picture class about how all these different things fit together. So the purpose of this class, again, uh, the goal is just for you to be able to sort of recognize the different components and have a general idea of how all these things fit together. So it's going to be very walk y the way I like to do. This is like my new favorite way of doing things. So we're going to do it this way again. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. So this is JavaScript, so it's very picky about punctuation. 
So if you get an error or something, it's probably just you forgot a parenthesis or something. Don't think like, oh man, I don't know anything about Express. It's just you made a typo, whatever. We've all been there before. But if that happens, um, so this is going to be the thing where like I code a bit and then you go and look at screenshots of like the differences in the code and then you code along and catch up. If you get stuck, uh, like just tilt your screen down and just take notes, whatever. Don't stress out about it. The whole purpose of this class, again, is just to get familiarity with these things. So if you fall behind, totally okay. It was probably just a typo. But we'll also be giving you lots of opportunities to go and catch up and code yourselves. Um, and so I can scooch over and help out at that point. And that's pretty much it before we actually talk about what we're going to be building today. So any questions, like just high-level questions about this stuff so far? Matt. So is that why you can't say I guess file or anything in JavaScript? Yep, everything is JavaScript. Um, so I would say that's the big reason why the mean stack exists. Um, so up until like yesterday, actually, you may have heard me say like, yeah, I don't even know why the mean stack exists. I mean, like, there's no reason to use Mongo and Angular together. They just sort of happen to come out at the same time. And it's true, they did just sort of happen to come out at the same time. But what I realized as I was putting this class together, actually, is that because everything is in that sort of JavaScript notation, there are some things that are really convenient about using Angular and Mongo together. Mongo basically stores things as JSON, as JSON objects. It doesn't literally do that, but it sort of does that. What that means is that if you have some sort of an object in Angular, you can just send that entire object, like even if it has you know, sub-objects and, and arrays inside it, you can send that entire thing to Mongo and it can save it. You can't do that with Rails. If you wanted to send an array into Rails, there's not a way to save an array in Postgres, or Postgres can't save arrays. But Mongo can. Um, so it actually is kind of cool being able to send stuff from Angular into Mongo. And hopefully we'll see more of that later on in this class. Anything else? Cool. So uh, this uh, app that we're going to be making today is this gorgeous thing called Win President, which you saw last night. It has three lines of CSS, so you get bonus points if you make a pull request on this repo with some more CSS to make it not look so ugly. Yeah, or whatever. Um, so the whole idea of this is that when you sign in, well, you sign in with Twitter. So authentication happens through Twitter, which we'll be getting to next week. And then when you sign in, you become a candidate for the presidency. So here I am, and I can say, I'm going to be president, running for president in 2024. I refresh my page and that should have saved. There it is. And then you can add a position. So it's like, I like turtles. Okay, there we go. And you can like, you know, you can concede, which is just deleting your account. You can change your mind, which is just deleting one of these positions. Uh, I like wombats or whatnot. Uh, and so you can delete these, and then you can also endorse a candidate. So here I am endorsing myself. I'm not entirely sure why this form goes away. That's a bug that I'll have to fix. Um, but you can endorse a candidate only once. Uh, and so if I go over to, oh, I know it's broken. So we're just going to pretend that that worked totally fine. Um, anyway, so we're going to be working up to that. So that has Angular in it. We're not going to get to Angular today. That'll be uh, with Nick next week. OK. Any questions about that before we start? I'm not really sure what questions there would be. But if there are, that's cool too. OK, let's go ahead and start. So I'm going to be, uh, I'm opening up this. Oh, actually, I'm not opening up this link yet. Uh, clone down this when president thing if you haven't yet. And even if you have, there are a couple other steps. So when you clone it down, you get like the finished product, and we're not to that point yet. Uh, we're going to be just doing stuff with the starter code. So I'm going to follow the instructions that are here in the lesson plan. I'm going to clone it down. Oh, that went well. There we go. I'm going to CD into it. And then I'm going to run this git checkout efab blah blah blah. That's the the ID of the commit that we're checking out to. It's the very first commit in this repo. 
And then I'm going to make a new branch from that called starter code. And so even if you're not done with that yet, that's okay, because the first part of this is going to be me walking through steps and then you guys walking through steps after I do that. So, um, let's see. Well, actually, you know what? This first one might be good for us to do together. So I take that back. Actually, do try to get to a branch, a new branch called starter code. You know you did it right if when you type ls, all you see is a readme. Anyone having trouble? That's okay. Yeah, if you have m.json and node modules, that's fine. Any problems? All right. So the first thing I want you to do, oh no, not that computer. <laughs> Okay, so the first thing I want you to do is to type npm init. <coughs> npm init. This thing is going to pop up. So npm init, it's sort of like creating a gem file in Rails. Remember gem files that have like all the different gems that you want to use in your Rails app? When you do npm init, it's going to throw this at you. Uh, it's saying this utility will walk you through creating a package.json file. So package.json, that is the gem file for node apps. Uh, and so it's going to ask you a couple questions here. You can literally just hold down return. You don't need to worry about any of those. Um, I mean, if you want to, you can look at those questions, but they just ask you, are you sure you want this thing to be in your package.json? Yes, you're sure. So just hit return, answer yes for all of them. When you're done with that, you should see you now have this package.json in here. You don't need to do anything with that. In fact, you should never directly edit that file, I would say. Um, it's sort of like how gemfile.lock, you should never directly edit that file. Just run bundle install or whatever, and it edits that file for you. But what's inside here is all of this sort of information about your app, all of this stuff inside here. Uh, who can tell me what NPM is? Yeah, so what is it like in the Rails world? Yeah, kind of. Um, actually, yeah, exactly. So NPM, it installs modules, Node modules. Uh, that's like Ruby gems. Node has modules, Ruby has gems. And so NPM, this thing, Node Package Manager, it manages all those modules. So it'll install all them for you. So NPM is almost the exact same thing as bundle in Rails. And you did bundle install, here you're gonna do NPM install. So keeping that in mind, Whenever you open up or download or whatever a new Node app, uh, if ever you clone one down, the very first thing you should do is npm install. That's just like how with Rails, the very first thing you should do is bundle install. Uh, here, we just created this one. We're not cloning it down, so you should be fine with npm in it. Um, so the next step in here is npm install dash dash save express. And so what this is doing is it's downloading and installing a new module. So right now we just have a node app. We need to download Express. So that's what we're doing right here. We're doing npm install dash dash save Express. And that looks on the npm website for this Express module and downloads it. This dash dash save does something really important. Uh, if I look at this package.json now, I can see that there's this little dependency section and express has been added right there. This is really important. Dash dash save takes whatever it is you installed and it puts it in package.json. That's the whole point of dash dash save. If you do npm install express, it'll download it and put it in that node modules folder that you see in there. But it's not going to add it to this file. So npm install express does not add it to package.json. npm install dash dash save express does add it to package.json. So you probably always want to use dash dash save. 
That way, anyone else who clones down your app, they're going to see that it's there inside your package.json. So can someone uh, word vomit that back at me? What's the point of using dash dash save? Matt? Exactly. Yep, that's exactly right. And so when you do npm install, you get this node modules folder. Um, so if I run tree in here, I can see that it's got a bunch of stuff inside it. So node is different from Ruby in that when you install a gem, it installs it in sort of a magical place on your computer, like somewhere else, somewhere in your root directory. When you do npm install, it installs everything inside this node modules folder. It creates a new folder called node modules and it puts everything inside it. So it installs it locally to that directory. Um, I'm not entirely sure why they chose to do it that way. Like it's definitely a lot tidier to have everything stored in a magical place the way Ruby does, but whatever. What this means though is that you'll need, let's see, uh, you never want to push up your node modules to GitHub because there is a lot of stuff in that folder. What you want to do is you want to git ignore that node modules folder. So what you're going to do is create a git ignore file. So this isn't in the instructions. We're just going to do this right now. You're going to do touch dot git ignore. And then inside that, you're just going to put the name of the folder that you do not want to be included with git. So in this case, it's node modules. I'm going to put node modules, node modules slash, that would work. I like to say node modules slash star. I think they work the exact same way. And that's going to tell git, do not worry about anything inside this node modules folder. It's telling it, just ignore any changes that happen inside the node modules folder. I can guarantee that like half the class at some point is going to end up pushing all their node modules up to GitHub anyway. It happens. Not a big deal. It's just like a whole bunch of extra stuff that is just, just makes it take a lot longer. All right. So, so far we basically just covered NPM and what NPM install does and what NPM install dash dash save does. Uh, so, any questions about this stuff, about NPM? Sarah? You say, um Yep, so you're going to create a dot git ignore file and then you're going to put node modules slash star inside. Uh, so you should, sort of like how you always ignore the dot git folder, you never need to do anything inside this dot git folder. You should never need to do anything inside this node modules folder either. You can just forget about it. It's there. As long as it's there, you're fine. You can just forget about it and not touch it. Any questions? Okay. So that's getting Node all set up. Now, uh, so this is where I want you guys to not code along with me. Now I'm going to go on ahead. Uh, I'm going to create an index.js file. Doesn't have to be called index.js, but by default, this is like the main file that every node app looks for. It looks for index.js. Uh, in here, I'm going to start off with a couple of things. I'm going to say var express equals require express. And again, I would, I would rather you not do this along with me. I'm not going to yell at you if you do, but. Uh, okay, and then I'm going to say app.listen 3001 function console.log I'm alive. Oops. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do this app.get thing. I'm going to say res.send hello. And that's it. Okay, so I have just created a node app. This is a node app. Now I'm going to fire it up. Uh, to do that, I'm going to, uh, if you did the install setup thing last night, you should have nodemon. I'm just going to type nodemon. I'm not sure if it's nodemon or node 
or node daemon. Either way, I say node mon. Yeah. What? No daemon. Whatever floats your boat. Okay, and the last step is I'm going to go to, well, actually, can anyone figure out from this page what URL I'm going to go to in my web browser? Wow, okay, awesome. Yeah. Localhost 3001, and I should see hello. There it is. Uh, if I change this to hello world, I see hello world. If I change this to slash test, and I try to go to just plain old slash, I'm not going to get anything. I'm going to have to go to slash test. And there it is. This is a node app. There's no uh, HTML back here. It's just this piece of text. And that's it. OK. So now I have all these questions for you guys. Well, the first one, I'm just going to tell you that NodeMon, well, let me show you this without NodeMon. So without NodeMon, what I would do is I would just type node. I would not, excuse me, I would type, I would type node index.js. And then if I go to localhost 3001 slash test, that's still showing up. But let me change this back to just plain old hello. I'm going to save it. And notice that this doesn't update. So what NodeMon does is it detects whenever you save a file and it automatically restarts the server. So everything that shows up in your browser is fresh and new. So it detects every time you make a change and ensures that everything in your server is all good to go. If you're falling asleep, not to name name Charles, uh, but maybe go ahead and like work standing in the back or something. Um, OK, so let's see. All right, so there's that. So first question, what does require do? Matt. Uh, yeah, it's, well, it's not necessarily forcing it to use Express. So this is the way you load dependencies. Uh, remember how in Ruby, uh, every once in a while we had something like, like require try or something like that. That's just a way of saying, hey, Node, I want to use this particular module. You require it. Uh, in Ruby, we never saved it to a variable, but here we are going to save it to a variable. When you require something, usually you're going to save it to a variable or something. Uh, and we'll talk about more about how that actually works later on. But require is how you load a module from this node modules folder. So if I wanted to, I've got express in here. If I try to require wombat, it should throw an error at me. It's going to say cannot find module wombat. So it's going to look in here for a folder called whatever this is, and then it's going to load it up. And here we go. Now we get I'm alive. That's all good. Uh, I'll get to that question later on. OK, so uh, notice that express here has parentheses at the end of it. So what does that mean we're getting back when we require that thing? What in JavaScript has parentheses like that at the end of it? A function, exactly. So what we're getting back from that require express is a function. Check this out. I'm going to create a new file in here, and I'm just going to call it hello.js. And I'm going, actually, no, I'm not going to do this again. I'll do that down the road. Do I said that? Yeah, Clarissa. Uh, Christine. Christine, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I knew it was a C. So the Mm -hmm. It's referring to the variable name. So if I call this wombat, then this has to become wombat. I'm just calling it express because that's what it is, and that makes the most sense to me. Matt? So what's going on here is, actually, you know what? I will do this now. Um, I'm going to create a hello.js file. And then in here, I'm going to put something that looks really weird. Module.exports equals, what's up, Matt? OK. And now I'm going to do var hello equals require hello. What's different about this and this? 
Yeah, it's got a dot in front of it. If this doesn't have a dot in front of it, like Express doesn't have a dot in front of it, it's going to look in the Node Modules folder for something called Express. If it does have a dot and a slash in front of it, it's just going to look around for a file called that. So uh, it's looking around for a file called hello, and I'm going to console log it. Now I see submat right there. So what happened was I required that hello file. All it has is this submat inside it. It has this module.exports equals submat. This is a way of saying what it should get when it loads this file. So check this out. If I say var text equals sup mat, and then down here I say module.exports equals text, I'm still going to get sup mat right here. If I say var text equals it's Christine, not Clarissa, then I'm going to get it's Christine, not Clarissa down here. So there is require and there's module.exports, and they're basically opposite things. Require is how you load something from another file. Module.exports is something inside that file that says what should be sent out of that file. So if I do something like module.exports equals function, console.log text, uh, now I'm going to do hello, and I'm going to put parentheses after it. That's because what it's getting out of this file is a function. So if I just do console.log hello, I'm probably going to see function right here. If I do console.log hello, I'm probably going to see undefined, and then it's Christine, not Clarissa. So module.exports, that's what is returned out of this file. That's saying, hey, no, when you load this hello.js file, you're going to get a function out of it. And so you should treat it like a function. Hello loads a function, so I'm, if I want to use it, I'm going to put parentheses after it. Okay. Yep, anytime I save anything anywhere in here, it's going to reload the server. So this means that somewhere inside Express, there has to be module.exports equals function something something something. That Express module has to be doing module.exports equals Express, or equals function, something like that. Weird, right? Okay, uh, what does this dot get in app.get indicate? Matt? Mm -mm. It's not a getter. No. Sarah? Uh, sorry, Winnie. Uh, yeah, it's a path, but specifically, what, is the, what does get mean? Where are we seeing get for? Cam? Exactly. It's a GET request. So this is saying whenever someone makes a GET request to this URL, do whatever it tells you to do in here. So if I put console.log way to go cam, then anytime someone goes to that URL, I should see way to go cam down here. Uh, any thoughts as to what stands for? And res? Response, exactly. So inside each of these, uh, these root functions over here, there are two different objects that go into it. There's a request object and there's a response object. Uh, the request object, that represents all of the data that's coming in. The response object represents all of the data that's going out. That's why here uh, I'm putting dot send onto the response object. If I did rec dot send, that doesn't really make sense. I'm not going to send back the request I just got. Dot send is something you put onto the response, saying I'm going to respond with this piece of text right here. 
Uh, if I have like if I do something like this, I can do console.log rec params dot name and if I do Robin over here now whenever I run this file I should see Robin so this rec params it's saying look in the params that were sent with this request for something called name this is the exact same syntax as in uh, Rails, Sinatra, everywhere else you saw that like slash ID thing. Angular is the same syntax. Uh, exact same thing. It's saying look for params in the URL. And the params are associated with the request. That's the stuff coming in, and then you're doing something with it, and then you're sending a response. So whenever someone makes a request to slash test slash something, take whatever that something was, and then respond with hello. Uh, these don't have to be called rec and res. I mean, these could be, you know, Alice and Bob, and then I would, this one would be Bob, I guess. You can call these whatever you want, but I'm already getting confused by this. So it's just convention to call them rec and res. All right. And then the very last thing I want to show is what happens if you don't do res.send. I'm going to go back to test. I'm going to save that and then I'm going to refresh this page and see how my browser is just sort of churning around over there. It just keeps on going and going. My browser is waiting for some kind of a response from this particular route it went to and it's not getting anything. So it's just going to keep on waiting until eventually it times out. Every single route in here is going to have res, <coughs> excuse me, res dot something. There are methods for HTML and for other things as well. Res.send just sends a piece of text. But there's got to be something or else it's just your browser's just going to keep on waiting for it to get some data back. All right, so uh, I'm not going to take questions yet because I want you guys to get up to this point first. So go ahead and run through setting this up. One thing I want to point out before you do, uh, if ever you see this slash dev null, that means you're creating a new file. So in this place, you're creating index.js. Uh, and obviously, don't actually type these plus signs and don't type this weird thing with the add symbols either. Uh, everything with a plus, that's text that you're adding. Whoops, shit, sorry. All right, so go ahead and start off with that. And you're done when you can go to your browser and get hello world. Uh, and it shouldn't take too long, so I'm going to do five minutes for this. <laughs> 